You can see that the Pathfinder force are doing their work with deadly accuracy. The main force of bombers begins to arrive. The attack starts to build up. There are several kinds of flashes you will see during the run over the target. And now, as they run out of the target area and set course for home, they leave behind the flaming battlefield of yet another victory for Bomber Command. Another successful action in the great night offensive to cripple the Nazi war machine. It's 12.19 a.m. on January 29, 1944. And a Lancaster bomber, serial number JB412, and a part of the elite British Bomber Command, has just taken off from near Cambridgeshire in the UK for the German mainland and their target, Berlin. The Allies hope the massive raid will cripple the Nazi regime. Lancaster JB412 carries a crew of seven, including one Australian, Flight Sergeant John Tree, a young sheet metal worker from Brisbane. And the plan is to head towards a waypoint over occupied southern Denmark, then turn southeast and make a beeline to Berlin. Come on, keep it, Tommy, get tacky. Now watch your height. I'm watching everything. Okay. How many searchlights would you call them? (laughs) Too many, I reckon. A couple of thousand. Yeah, they're searching for us. Oh, hell. The moment the bombers reach the German mainland, the sky lights up like a highway, filled with searchlights, flares, flak, and German night fighters. Then at 2.20 a.m., Lancaster JB-412 is hit by an enemy plane and catches fire. Other bomber command planes around them explode and fall from the sky. That early morning alone sees the loss of 49 Allied planes. As for John Tree, he is last seen wearing his parachute, gripping the ripcord, before disappearing out of the doomed plane and into the black night. The fate of John Tree, lost to history until now, was the starting point for the Australian's European correspondent Jacqueline Magne and her Queensland-based journalistic colleague, Ellen Winnett, who have co-authored an extraordinary feature story in tomorrow's Weekend Australian magazine, not just about Flight Sergeant John Tree, but what happened to up to 140 Australians who died over and remain interred in Denmark during World War II. When we ponder the heroism of Australians who served with valour in military campaigns throughout the first half of the 20th century, very few of us associate that flat Scandinavian country with theatres of war like Gallipoli or the Somme. It may be time now to revise that history. Here's Jacqueline. Well, we didn't know about Denmark either, and both Ellen and I have covered Europe uh, for a long time now, but It was totally unknown to us that more than 100 Australian airmen were buried in Denmark. And it came about because of the Battle of Berlin, which again is a major battle which is largely forgotten now. And it involved thousands of warplanes, the big heavy bombers, attempting to obliterate Berlin in late 1943, early 1944. And this was a a massive air campaign to try and demoralise the Germans. And it was quite critical, at a critical time in the war and a critical time for the Allies to try and assert some sort of dominance because at that time they weren't winning the war. And so this was quite a crucial campaign and and a big campaign and a very costly campaign that ended up 55,000 airmen died in Bomber Command. So it's an extraordinary story that both Ellen and I felt that we needed to tell. The spark for Jacqueline and Ellen's investigation came from an unexpected email sent to Ellen. She explained. It came out of the blue with an email from Peter Tree. Peter Tree is a federal 
circuit court judge based in Queensland, but I knew Peter 20 years ago in Tasmania when I was a journalist there and he was a barrister. And he sent me an email and he said, I hope you remember me and I need your help. My uncle was killed in Denmark and uh, the 80 year anniversary of his death is coming up. The Danes are holding a small ceremony to honour his death and I'm trying to find the British families who were in his flight crew. So Peter and Laurel were very keen to try and invite the Brits along to um, meet the Danes who had honoured and preserved the memory of the Allied airmen who died on Danish soil. So the long journey of this narrative began uncovering not just unimaginable heroism, but a little-known corner of Australian military history. Here, Jacqueline explains what Australians were doing in the line of fire over Denmark. John Tree was an airman in this plane, a Lancaster, the JB-412. It was one of the pathfinders, and so it led the way for the formation of, you know, hundreds of bombers as they went to bomb Berlin. But that night, I found that there were actually three planes involving Australians that came down within 66 minutes of each other over Denmark. So we had Australians falling out of the sky in just a little over an hour. Some of them survived, some of them didn't. So we are telling that those stories of those airmen, concentrating on John Tree, of course, our main man, but also telling the stories of these other two planes, which were, for all the military buffs out there, they can all look it up. It's HK-537, another Lancaster, and a Halifax, which was HX-297. As part of her research, Jacqueline travelled to Denmark, stood at the exact sites where some of these ill-fated planes went down eight decades earlier and found families who for years have folded this tragedy into their generational folklore. Inevitably, any history of Australians in combat usually reveals a humble story behind the heroics, and Flight Sergeant John Tree was no different. Ellen paints a picture of this young man from Queensland. He was one of four siblings from Brisbane. He signed up with the RAAF at 18 and ended up in the UK serving with the Bomber Command, which was comprised of airmen from all over the then British Empire. They worked out that it was a a more effective way of training them all together and, and combining them into one force. John Tree wrote these lovely letters home to his mum and dad and just these very dry observations about on his days off, he would he would go to Eton and he'd just be amazed by the Eton boys in their top hats. He'd never seen such a thing in, in Brisbane in the 1940s. And Peter Tree's father, Arthur, was the youngest brother of John Tree. And the family held out hope for many, many months that he would be found alive. On the ground in Denmark, Jacqueline, with the help of locals, was able to hear about that terrible night firsthand from surviving witnesses and their families and to read a dramatic account written down by then 11-year-old schoolboy and local villager Hans Brandt. Well, I spoke to several of the eyewitnesses. I didn't speak to Hans, he's now dead, but he had written an account of that Mm. night and he spoke about how he and his brothers... And some friends went and they desperately, you know, they knew that the plane had crashed. They'd all hid uh, when they heard the plane coming down, seeking shelter in a house in the basement. And so it, for a schoolboy, you know, aged 11, you know, it's pretty exciting stuff, actually, really. I mean, it's horrible, but they just went and found the plane and, and parts of the wreckage. And, and descri- he described in quite graphic detail about what he saw there which was, you know, the oil and, and all the tin foil that they used to use to try and jam the, the German radar systems. So that was scattered all over the fields. And it's quite vivid, isn't it? Jacqueline was also keenly interested in the other Australians, apart from John Tree, who perished that night. Incredibly, she found a living witness. I also spoke directly to an eyewitness 
of the second plane that came down, which contained three Australian crew. And unfortunately, this plane just exploded on impact and all on board died. But this eyewitness, he just spoke how his farmhouse, the windows exploded. Such was the impact of the explosion and how he and his family to this day, every Saturday, still lay flowers on the area where the plane came down and they have a propeller engraved and it's quite a, a you know, very evocative place to go and visit, actually. As for John Tree of Brisbane, he was spectacularly unlucky in death. The landscape, the time of year, the all-consuming blackness, the circumstantial roll of the dice was against him. You've got to remember, this is in January in Europe, so it is cold, it is snowy, it is pitch black. You know, this is blackout Europe in wartime. And John Tree turned to his crewman, didn't say a word. One of the others said something briefly to him and they all jumped out. And unfortunately, John landed in water and it was very pitch black and very cold. They believe that some fishermen heard his cries for help, but they couldn't find him in the darkness. And this is a very, he was so unlucky. This is such a narrow strip of water that he landed in, only about 100 metres across. So he just missed the land. And it's so unfortunate because the rest of his crew, most of them survived. One landed in a rhododendron bush at the vicar's place. Another one landed on a postal exchange. He hurt his head landing, but that's the pilot, Willie Simpson. And the others landed in farmland. So it was just poor John who was just so desperately unlucky. The big question remains, why is this critical slice of history so little known in Australia? Here's Ellen again. I think one of the great tragedies of the Bomber Command service in the war is that it was virtually whitewashed from history. The Bomber Command were incredibly brave. Their casualty rates were extremely high. It was the air wars of Europe in World War II were one of the most dangerous theatres, if not the most dangerous theatre of that war. But in Australia, we don't know much about it because we tended to tell the story in Australia of World War II through the fights that happened in the Pacific and the war with the Japanese rather than the air wars against the Nazis in Europe. But all this time, this group of Danish citizens have been very quietly, without fanfare, just honouring the memory of these allied airmen. They've built little stone memorials. You see this throughout Western France a little bit, but to find them in Denmark, as, as Jack did, was amazing. There's 146 known Australian men who died there who are buried in Denmark. The 80th anniversary this year is an opportunity for the Danes to, in some cases, upgrade some of those memorials and really an opportunity for them to mark the sacrifice of these men. They may have a new Australian-born queen, but the attachment the Danes have shown to our lost airmen has never diminished in eight decades. And in the end, the explanation is pretty straightforward. Jack Willen interviewed Danish historian Anders Bardsgaard Sitrarup about the significance of the Australian airman's sacrifice to his country. And these memorial stones, can you explain to an Australian audience what they are and what they mean? Uh, they mean that, uh, well, we have our history and uh, the crew of this bomber is also a part of our history. And uh, when you look at the inscriptions uh, on them, uh, in many cases, uh, it is something like, they died for us. 